Judging from the number of emails that we're getting about the CNC router project, there's a lot more interest in this type of machinery than I initially thought. Uh, recently, we've been getting a lot of requests for an update on the status of the project. Well, there's some good news to report and some bad news. Uh, we'll go through and show you some of the changes that we've done, why we've made those changes. Many of them are nothing more than just fun experiments for us to work with while we're doing a lot of thorough testing on the rest of the machinery. One of the changes that I've done is to take that large operator panel and condense it down, and we'll show you that in a minute. But then it allowed me to move my keyboard over here where it's much more convenient to use. And it's still on the same slide mechanism that our old operator panel was on. So we can slide it out of the way or put it in a position that's very comfortable for typing in this, the programs and so forth. I've also moved the trackball over here. It's underneath the table, so it's somewhat protected by some of the dust and so forth. Then the operator panel got a lot smaller, and we'll show you that here real quick. The new operator panel is roughly 8 inches high by 10 inches wide, and about an inch, inch and a quarter thick. And it uses just a series of small, uh, what are called tactile switches, and they're mounted up on a small circuit board. These uh, group of buttons here allow me to select the different modes of operation for the machine. These select different jogging modes for when I'm manually positioning the machine, as do these buttons. Here's our start, our stop button. These buttons over in this area turn on the spindle, uh, vacuum clamping, and a few other accessories that have yet to be added to the machine. This rotary switch here allows me to override the spindle speed. This allows me to override the feed rate. And this switch here, or rotary switch rather, allows me to control how fast the machine moves when we're manually jogging it. These two little switches here are joysticks. We can move the axes up and down, left and right, and forward and backward by moving these joysticks. They're very similar to this, the type of joystick that you'd find on a gamepad. This hand wheel here allows me to move the machine or any axes of the machine by simply rotating this dial. I can move it very, very slowly or at a fairly rapid feed rate. It gives me very precise control over it. Now again, this device here is something that you would make up on your own. We probably won't include it uh, in the project initially as we release it. It may be something that we'll add later on at a later time. Because you can actually run the machine without this. These are just fun and uh, just a handy way to control the machine. Moving on from the operator panel, one of the fundamental changes that I really wanted to make was something for ergonomics. Part of the problem with the old layout was the keyboard wasn't at a comfortable height to type the programs in. And I am a touch typist, so for me it's important to be comfortable. The monitor was a nightmare for me on the old system. Uh, this part of the frame was a little bit lower on the old machine, but the monitor was still too high, and I wear bifocals, so I'm sitting there trying to work the machine by tilting my head way back. A few hours into it, and I got a stiff neck. To solve that problem, I moved the monitor toward a shelf at the back of the machine, just a simple shelf that was made out of some scrap plywood and so forth laying around in the shop. But it's off at a distance where I can see it very clearly, and it's out of the way of the working envelope. The computer is moved up on top again where it was before, and it's brought forward where I can gain access to some of the controls, where I plug in my, my small removable hard drive and so forth. I've now got an emergency stop switch in, located up front where it's very important uh, in case there's a problem or something. You just bump the switch and that shuts down all the, the motion portions of the machine. Another change that was pretty dramatic compared to the old system, but it was needed to do some experimenting to push the machine to its limits. And you'll see this large box here where the router normally goes. You'll see our dust collection port. That allows us to attach our dust collection to drawing the chips up from underneath, and just a vinyl skirt around it to help contain that. But this is where the real change is. You'll notice here that there's no longer an ordinary router in here. Now we've used about four or five different brands of routers in here and they've all performed very well. But uh, with the way we're testing the machine with long duration runs and so forth, handheld routers really aren't meant to be run continuously for eight hours at a time and so forth. They're more uh, designed for intermittent use. So I went about and designed up a 20,000 RPM spindle cartridge. That's this unit back here. And then I've adapted a DC motor to drive that spindle. 
down below, we've added a quick change spindle adapter, or a quick change tool adapter, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. But anyhow, uh, we had to add the electronics to drive the variable speed DC motor. We've got a tachometer up here to provide feedback back to the CNC control. The motor is coupled to the spindle cartridge with a timing belt. Uh, some people commonly refer to these as cog belts, but it's a direct drive system, very, very positive drive. Uh, but it is a bit noisy with this type of belt. Uh, basically, the motor is almost silent at uh, its max RPM, and the spindle cartridge is very quiet, but the timing belt is quite noisy. It is a little bit quieter than a handheld router, but not much. Uh, but other than that, uh, you know, realistically, this whole component here, our spindle system, was just beefed up to allow us to run long-term tests and very, very heavy cutting. So in the project plan, we really won't be showing any of this information about the spindle drive. We'll be using a standard uh, router that you can purchase. When I designed the spindle, I designed it so that it is the same as a Porter Cable router. So in other words, I can use Porter Cable collets right on the end of this. But I also wanted to adapt a quick change tool system. And uh, this is a Craftsman system. And that's how long it takes to put in a new tool. To take out the tool, you lift up the, the collar here, you push this up, and pull the tool out. So it's a very quick change system. It's actually quite uh, rigid, too. Uh, you wouldn't want to take real, real heavy cuts with it. Uh, in fact, their, their literature recommends to only take an eighth inch depth of cut. I've tested it out a little, much deeper than that, but uh, you'll definitely see some uh, wandering of the cutter in real heavy cuts. But nonetheless, it's got a quick change ability, and that seems to be working out quite nicely. One of the problems that came up with the design of the machine is that the z-axis, this up and down motion, started losing position. And you obviously don't want that in a CNC system. Now at first I thought it was because of the heavier spindle motor, spindle cartridge and so forth, and this extra weight of the box out here. All this has to be carried by the z-axis motor. The more weight we have here, the more work that this motor has to do to move it up and down. Now, we started out, of course, with the older motor up here, but to help counter this, I used some nitrogen-filled uh, springs, or gas springs, one on each side of the headstock, and then these neutralize the weight or mass of the headstock so that it doesn't take any more force to go down than it does to go up. It's neutrally buoyant. Well, that didn't correct the problem. So then the next step was to swap out our old motor that was on the z-axis. It was one of these old surplus motors for a newer hybrid motor. And it's about almost half the size, but it's got about 50% more torque in power. And that proved to be a real nice benefit. It didn't solve the problem completely, but it certainly did help a lot. And one of the things I'd like to show you is I'll move these axes around to show you the performance difference between this type of motor, the old surplus, and then the new motors that we're planning on going with. Now I'll start out by moving the Y axis, which would be this motion, and you'll get an idea of how slow the old motors were. Now you'll hear the motor accelerate up, move at full speed, and then when it goes to stop, it will decelerate down. Now let's move the z-axis with the new motor. Notice how it's much quicker to accelerate, much more positive on its motions, and its overall top performance speed is much higher. So the motors are performing very well, but it didn't solve our problem that we were having with losing position. So again, we dug in deeper to try and find the problem. As it turned out, the problem appears to be in the component that I felt was the best one possible to go with, the ball screw. Uh, ball screws, as I mentioned before, have a nut, and you'll see these round threads here. The, uh, between the nut and the threads of the, the screw, there's ball bearings to allow very, very free motion. These are about 95% efficient with transferring rotary motion into linear motion. They're also very rigid. However, they don't seem to do very well long-term running dry. Now, of course, they're designed to be lubricated with oils and so forth. The problem with that is 
on a woodworking machine, it's very difficult to use oil lubrication. If we allowed oil on this screw, two things are going to happen. The oil is going to drip off and get on our work, which will be a problem. And worse, all the dust, airborne dust or even um, moving dust, is going to track to that oil, cake onto this screw, and gum up the works. Now there are bellows or covers that you can get to cover up the ball screws. The sad part of that is these telescoping covers or the bellows can cost more than the actual ball screws that we've got here. So we're going to switch out some of the ball screws. Whoa, hold on there a minute. Well, as you know, this update was supposed to be presented in our last issue, but it wouldn't fit. Uh, but in that time that's passed between then and now, we've found a new product that may have solved the problem with the ball screws running without lubrication. It's a Dow Corning product. It's a dry film lubricant that you apply to the ball screw and it chemically bonds with the metal on the ball screw and provides long-term lubrication. So I've given it a try here on a couple of the ball screws and it's performing quite well. Being a dry film lubricant, I thought perhaps even the table saw might benefit from it from the, for the trunnion adjustments for the elevation and tilt and so forth. You never want to use a wet lubricant on those either. So I sprayed them with the same lubricant. It's working quite well in that application as well. So we do have this fresh new update with regard to the ball screw problem that we were having. Now we'll return you back to the original program. Now the way system that we're using, these aluminum extrusions, seem to be performing very well with all the dust and uh, debris that will get collected on them and so forth. In fact, it's kind of a policy around here not to clean these off, just leave them be as dirty and dusty as they are and see if it creates any problems. There have been no problems at all with the sliding motion using this way system. Now this next component I'd like to talk about is something that uh, came about primarily to answer a question that one of the viewers sent in, or I should say maybe even a comment. Uh, the comment was basically that uh, you know, CNC machines are fine, but they really have no purpose. Uh, they're very slow to set up and so forth, uh, which is really a very false statement. Uh, CNC machines are very efficient. Their original design was for making uh, tooling fixtures and so forth, one-off pieces and so on. Uh, they're very, very fast and very easy to set up. Now, the particular software that we're using, the mock CNC software uh, from a company called Art of CNC, located up in Canada, uh, their software allows you to modify it uh, to do some very fancy things. Now in this case, this particular probe uh, is a little simple thing that we machined up here in the machine shop. All it really does is the tool will come down, push down on this plunger, which in turn connects to that switch. And it makes for a very precise measurement device. Now what I'm going to demonstrate to you real quickly is how to measure these two different tools. Now, of course, they're different lengths, and the machine needs to know what length each tool is. So we'll start out by putting one of the tools in the spindle. Now we switch to the second tool. Put that in. And as you can see, the measurement of the tools went very quickly and very easily. And having fun with the macro language within the software, we even made it talk back to you rather politely. One of the other features we've been experimenting with is vacuum clamping and how to incorporate it cost effectively. As you can see, we've got a small shop vac attached at the back of the machine. Holes on that comes into our table system where we've got basically our vacuum clamp. The vacuum clamp table is actually a secondary table that bolts or attaches to the machine's main table. It's a hollow core constructed very much like a torsion box. There's a number of ribs going across and then it's sandwiched two pieces of plywood top and bottom. Once it's on the machine, I wrote a program to machine these small squares at equal spacing, basically two inches apart. And that serves two purposes. It provides a nice simple means for me to take a small shim of wood, place it in that groove, and that creates a dead stop 
at a known location. So now I can very easily determine where my workpiece is in relationship to the table. Again, very fast for setup, because once I just count over the number of slots, I know it's, uh, in this case, uh, four inches up from the back and four inches over from the left. That tells me where my workpiece is, and I can put that data right into the control. Uh, the next thing we had to do on the table was drill a series of holes to allow air to go out to create the vacuum. Now, if we didn't use this gasket material, the air would just leak out all of these grooves. So we found some O-ring stock at an industrial supply outfit, and it's a square shape, so it's just a matter of pushing it down inside that groove, and that creates our seal. And that holds it down securely. Now, if you'll just bear with me for a moment, I'm going to give you a quick demonstration as to how you'd go about going from a CAD drawing into a CNC program. What we're going to use is the standard file format called DXF. Most CAD software can output this type of file format. So we'll select one. This is the shape that it's going to cut. We can set some cutting parameters using our layer control. We'll generate our G-code, give it a name, save it, and we have our program written. This is the shape of the state of Illinois. We'll go ahead and run that for you right now. Now I will caution you, there are times when you'll have to go through and edit some of the G-codes. So you will need to learn that, but it's really not that difficult. It's not much more difficult than actually reading a blueprint. And that's pretty much all there is to it to go about converting a CAD drawing into an actual physical shape. Now I would like to point out that uh, as much as you folks would like us to present this as a project plan, I really don't want to do it until I'm completely comfortable with the design that it will perform for you well in the long run. In fact, my goal is to get this machine to perform as good as many of the commercially available machines. So until next time, I'm Chris Dayhut for Woodworking at Home. Thanks for watching.